Good afternoon and welcome to the 2014-15 Bannon Institute on Ignatian Leadership. My name is Mick McCarthy and I serve as the Executive Director of the Ignatian Center for Jesuit Education. This year we will be exploring the theme of leadership, taking our inspiration from the spirituality of St. Ignatius, the founder of the Jesuits. But both this week and next week, we are commemorating the 25th anniversary of the, uh, the, the killing of the Jesuits and their collaborators at the University of Central America in El Salvador. To introduce the connection between the UCA martyrs and Santa Clara University, I'm pleased to begin by presenting uh, the following video. In El Salvador, one of the most brutal and violent days in 10 years of war, while rebels and government troops continued fighting for control of the capital city of San Salvador, a group of armed men entered the university there and brutally murdered eight people, including six Jesuit priests. For 10 years, this small country had suffered a terrible civil war. Over 75,000 people have been killed, including the Archbishop of San Salvador, Oscar Romero, and many church workers. Throughout the 1980s, Father Ignacio Ejacuria, the president of the university, emerged as a leading moral and intellectual voice, criticizing the violence of both sides in the civil war. He argued that peace would never be possible until all Salvadorians had a say in the political, economic, and social reality of the country. Fundador oficialmente es el rector de la universidad, eh, una universidad que tiene muy claro lo que tiene que hacer, eh, y es que más que formar estudiantes, más que hacer investigación, aunque hace esas dos cosas, lo que tiene que hacer es ponerse a resolver el problema inaceptable de la injusticia en este país y en todo el área centroamericana. For his outspoken stance, Ella Curia, his Jesuit brothers, their housekeeper, and her teenage daughter were killed. Long before their martyrdom, Santa Clara and other Jesuit schools had been inspired by the Luca's witness. In 1982, Father Ella Curia received an honorary doctorate at Santa Clara University's graduation. He challenged SCU to be a distinctive type of university, one that, in his words, must take into account the gospel preference for the poor to be a voice for those without voices. The relationship between Santa Clara University, the University of Central America, and the people of El Salvador has endured over the years. SCU's Casa de la Solidaridad is a semester-long international studies program that places undergraduates of many Jesuit universities among those with little access to power or privilege. Because we have so much to learn from them, Santa Clara supports regular immersion programs to El Salvador for students, faculty, staff, and university administrators. On November 16, 1989, when news hit Santa Clara of the murders of our sister university, a crowd packed the mission church for a hastily planned memorial mass. That was the first time I caught sight of the martyr's crosses. Eight students reverently carried them as part of the service. And the crosses were striking in their simplicity, white wooden sticks bolted together at the center with each victim's name handwritten on it with black felt pen. As the service ended and the congregation solemnly exited the church, it seems that a student got the inspiration to plant his or her cross in the front lawn of the church, and the others followed suit. The crosses have remained for more than 20 
Unfortunately, this video is available on our website. <laughs> Um, so, please see the rest of it. Welcome to the Jesuit University of Silicon Valley. Um, anyway, it ends up by talking about how the relationship between Santa Clara and, and the University of Central America has been really foundational to us uh, and informs our own mission at creating leaders of competence, conscience, and compassion. From the spirit of the Uca Martyrs, we turn to the theme, Leadership Born of Struggle and Hope, Rutilio Grande, Ignacio E. Correa, John Sabrino, and us. Four speakers will speak for 12 minutes each on each of these figures. Ana Maria Pineda from SCU's Religious Studies Department will reflect on struggle and hope in the life and leadership of Rutilio Grande. Kevin Burke from the Jesuit School of Theology on Ignacio, Ignacio E. Correa. Bob LaSalle Klein from Holy Names University on John Sobrino, and Lynette Parker from the Catherine and George Alexander Community Law Center on the mission of SCU as a social project. Would you please welcome the first of our speakers, Professor Ana Maria Pineda. Good afternoon. It's an honor for me to speak of Rutilio Grande and to introduce him to those who are gathered here today. In order to try and do this, I will be speaking about the reality in which the story of Rutilio Grande unfolds. I will highlight moments of Rutilio's life and try and suggest how this story can inform our own lives, our work, and commitment to justice. The history of El Salvador, one of the smallest countries in Central America, for centuries has been one of social, economic, and political inequality. The wealth of the country has been controlled by 13 families. Such inequality and extreme situations of poverty gave way to great social unrest, which eventually led to a civil war that began in 1980 and lasted for 12 years. During that time, over 75,000 people were killed or disappeared. Frutilio Grande was born on July the 5th, 1928 in El Paisnal, El Salvador. This small village offered few economic possibilities. Frutilio was the youngest of five brothers. When Frutilio was about four years old, his parents' marriage broke up quite painfully. Whatever security Frutilio had disappeared. His father left the country, leaving his wife to care for the children with few financial resources. Shortly afterwards, Rutilio's mother died, leaving her five sons to fend for themselves. The brothers were forced to go into the fields to work, while Rutilio was left at home with his grandmother. These years of insecurity and poverty left their mark on the young Rutilio. As a child, he was withdrawn, quiet, and insecure. When Rutilio was 12 or 13 years old, Archbishop Chavez y Gonzalez of San Salvador came to the small village of El Paisnal, where he spent several days blessing marriages, baptizing children, hearing confessions, celebrating mass. The Archbishop met the adolescent Rutilio and was struck by his serious demeanor. It was during this time that Rutilio expressed his desire to become a priest. Shortly afterwards, Rutilio entered the seminary. A few years later, he decided to enter the Society of Jesus. It was shortly after taking vows as a Jesuit that Rutilio suffered an unexplained psychological break which left him in a canatonic state. Rutilio was immobile and unresponsive to reality, unreality, unable to communicate with anyone, completely shut off from reality. He remained in this state for many months and was sent to Panama for treatment. Those caring for Rutilio were uncertain of the outcome. Gradually, he was restored to health, but for the rest of his life, he would struggle with bouts of depression, moments of severe scrupulosity, uncertainty, and later he suffered from de debilitating diabetes. 
In time, Rutilio resumed his studies for ordination in the small town of Onia in Spain. There, the enclosure of the seminary was challenging for Rutilio, but he had learned that in extending himself to others, his spirit was enlivened and he could try and overcome depression. He worked with the people and developed religious education programs. In Onia, Rutilio's ability to discover qualities of leadership in others emerged. His future ministry would be marked by his ability to identify and develop leaders. As the Second Vatican Council ended, Rutilio was sent to study at Lumen Vitae, one of the great centers for pastoral and catechetical renewal in Brussels. After a year, he returned to San Salvador to assume the responsibilities as prefect of discipline of the seminary and to teach the principles of pastoral ministry. Rutilio began a renewal of seminary formation. On weekends, he would take the seminarians to the surrounding towns to work directly with the people. His former students recalled that Rutilio enabled them to pastorally interact with the reality of the people and that he placed great trust in them. Rutilio return, turned the seminary into a center of theological and pastoral renewal, hosting conferences, workshops, and lectures. He was introducing a new approach to priestly formation and beginning to transform the model of church in El Salvador. However, the bishops of El Salvador lost confidence in Rutilio and eventually he was dismissed from the seminary. The dismissal from the seminary was painful for Rutilio. He decided to go to Bogota to study for a year at the Pastoral Institute of Latin America. There he was immersed in the latest pastoral thinking drawn from the Second Vatican Council. Upon his return to San Salvador, he was sent by his Jesuit superiors to the town of Aguilares with several Jesuit companions. There, Rutilio embarked on an innovative method of evangelization. He formed teams composed of Jesuits and laity. He would send out these teams to towns and villages for two weeks at a time. The priests would live with their assigned communities, preaching the gospel, celebrating the mass and the sacraments. All the while, the priests would identify lay leaders from within these communities, and new teams of evangelization would be formed. Despite his fragile health, Rutilio was tireless in not only proclaiming the gospel, but in teaching the people their constitutional rights. He drew strength from working to free people from poverty and oppression. As the people became aware of their rights, they demanded fair working conditions and wages. The landowners were resist resistant to this change and accused Rutilio of inciting the people against them. Rutilio insisted that he only proclaimed the gospel and that he was not taking sides with any political party. As this was happening in Aguilares, a growing unrest among the 13 rich families who controlled the wealth in the country began to escalate. Priests who adopted the teaching of the Second Vatican Council and who worked with the poor were, were blamed for the growing unrest. International priests working in El Salvador were the first to be targeted. A campaign to expel them from the country began. On February 13, 1977, a mass was organized in the town of Apopa to protest the kidnapping and expulsion of Father Mario Bernal, a priest from Colombia, South America. Rutilio was a gifted preacher, and from the pulpit he had often denounced the injustices suffered by the poor. Now he delivered a powerful sermon denouncing the expulsion of Father Bernal. Rutilio proclaimed, Our people have hunger of God and of bread. Let us not fool ourselves. The power of the people is in the hands of a minority. I fear that if Jesus himself crossed the border, they would not let him enter. My beloved brothers and friends, I fear that soon the Bible and the gospel will not be allowed to enter into our land, and only the Bible's cover would be permitted because all the words in the gospel are subversive. Naturally, they are all subversive because they confront the sin of our times. 27 days later, on March the 12th, 1977, 
As Sutilio traveled from Aguilares to El Paisnar to celebrate mass, the jeep he was driving was ambushed and riddled with bullets. Frutilio died with him. Frutilio died and with him 16-year-old Nelson Frutilio and 72-year-old Manuel Solorzano from Aguilares. Frutilio was 49 years old. The news of his death was met with unbelief. Frutilio was loved by many in El Salvador, among them his friend Archbishop Oscar Romero. Frutilio's courage in denouncing injustice was admired by many, but only those who knew him well were aware of just how much Rutilio struggled to overcome his weaknesses. He was a fragile man. Throughout his life, he constantly struggled with his physical and psychological fragility. We might ask ourselves, how was he then able to confront evil, greed, and injustice? We turn to his spiritual notes and find a partial answer. He writes, God wants me and has chosen me as I am with my limitations. To work to improve myself is necessary, but not to wish to be someone else with other qualities. I know that Christ loves me. I am in God's hands. I am gratified humanly by the small successes I achieve and by the hopes of others. God's work in my vocation is marvelous in helping me sort out the difficulties. God holds on to me. Thank you. Even my daily prayer for perseverance is also God's grace. Rutilio Grande was the first priest and Jesuit to be murdered in El Salvador. He was the proto-martyr, the first martyr in the struggle for justice. Rutilio's death inspired other priests and laity to make a preferential option for the poor. He had been an influential presence during their seminary formation, and now some among these priests would also die martyrs. Rutilio had many loves. He loved his family. He loved being Salvadoreño, the poor village of El Paisnal. He loved the church and being a Jesuit. He loved the poor. And in all of these, he found strength to see in his weaknesses God's grace and to use it for the sake of others. And in the people he found hope for the future. May his story help us discover how to live in our struggle with the hope of shaping a better tomorrow for others, especially those most in need. Thank you. And now I would like to invite my wonderful colleague, Father Kevin Burke. Thank you, and thank you, Anna Maria. Um, boy, that was beautiful. Uh, it was fast, but what a great story. And uh, two things that Anna Maria didn't tell us. One is that 30 days after, all the, after Rutilio was killed, all the Jesuits in El Salvador were ordered to leave the country within one month or they would be killed. And they gathered together to do a discernment about that, and together with the support of their father general, Father uh, Arupe in Rome, they made a decision to stay. The other thing Anna Maria didn't tell us is that Rutilio was her cousin. It's an amazing story. We move from the story of Rutilio to the story 12 years later of what has become known as the Uca Martyrs, the, the killing of six Jesuit priests a woman who was a mother and wife uh, and was a cook at the local seminary, the Jesuit House of Studies, and her 16-year-old daughter, Selena, uh, because they were killed to leave no witnesses. In many ways, the key figure here was Ignacio Eacria, the rector of the university. He had just returned from Spain, and it seems very clear that the killing was time to eliminate him. But before talking about these murders, I want to go back for a second to Rutilio. In 1977, when Rutilio was killed, Ignacio Acria was actually back in Spain. And the reason was he had been refused admittance into the country at the border the same day that Oscar Romero was consecrated as Archbishop in San Salvador, February 22, 1977. 
So Romero becomes bishop in San Salvador. Ayacuria is not allowed into the country. Three weeks later, Rutilio is killed on his way to celebrate Mass on a Saturday evening. Four weeks later, on Holy Saturday, April 9, 1977, from Spain, Ignacio Ayacuria, future martyr, wrote a letter to Oscar Romero, a future martyr, about Rutilio Grande, who had just been martyred. It's like something out of the Acts of the Apostles. And yet it's something that's happened within earshot of our own memories. He begins the letter with these words, Dear Monsignor, I've been following very closely and with abundant information the events of death and resurrection that have taken place during the month of March in El Salvador. And I have to say that I feel proud of your performance as a pastor. From this far off exile, I want you to know of my admiration and my respect because I've seen the finger of God in your action. So we have Rutilio, we have Archbishop Romero, who was killed just three years later, also shot in the heart while celebrating Mass. And during the years of the 1980s, as the Civil War raged, and as he served as president of the university, and by the way, I don't know how he did this, he wrote over 200 essays. The man was an incredible intellectual administrator and leader. Ignacio Acria was reflecting in this letter about the very meaning of martyrdom. And what's interesting, what emerges implicitly as we look at this letter, is that the witness of martyrs, see martyr means witness, right? The one who is killed, the one who dies for something that's worth dying for. The, the, we, the key here is that that witness is picked up by others. Others become aware of that witness and it changes them. And among those who witnessed Rutilio's witness were Archbishop Romero, who was changed by it. And his brother, Ignacio Eacuria. So they, Romero and Eacuria and others, become part of that community of witness. And here's what's interesting. We, here today, are part of that community of witness. We're invited into that. So to say a quick word about Eacuria, he wrote an article many years earlier entitled About Jesus. Why did they killed Jesus, and why did Jesus die? And it's a very interesting, brief article, and he wants to draw the point that it's not enough to just theologize about the death and say, well, Jesus died for our sins. There's actually a great danger in moving too quickly to that. The death of Jesus, like the death of these martyrs, was a mortal sin. And it was done because people with power didn't want their situation to be changed. They acted with impunity and they told lies. And the story comes up over and over in the Gospels and in the witness of these martyrs. And so Eacria is focusing on this and thinking about it. And to develop his reflections on Jesus, he asks these questions. He makes these three points. First, the historical dimension of the death of Jesus. What was the story? What was the historical reason for his death? Second, what was Jesus' own consciousness as he faced his death? And thirdly, what is the theological meaning of it? Very briefly, I'd like to put those three questions to Aeacharia. Why was he killed? He was killed for the same reasons Romero was and the same reason Rutilio was. He was trying to mediate a war and to not take sides. And he was trying to help people think about reality. What about the second point? What was Aeacharia thinking? What he writes about Jesus could be almost said of him. He says Jesus knew that his way of behaving was dangerous, that it was leading him to death. But he also knew that he had to announce the reign of God and allow its values and its demands to completely fill his mind and heart and completely drive his energies. That could have been written about Eacharia. It was written by him about Jesus. 
And thirdly, what's the significance of his death? Well, John Sabrino, who Bob LaSalle Klein will talk about in a moment, uses a very interesting word. He calls these martyrs Jesuitic. It has nothing to do with Jesuit. Well, I shouldn't say nothing to do. It's etymologically connected. It has to do with Jesus. He doesn't want to use the word Christological because that's too heady. It's too much of a up in the air. He wants to get right down on the earth where Jesus was and say, who are the martyrs that die for the same logic that Jesus died? Because there are some people who don't want us to call these people martyrs because they didn't die defending the church. And what Aea Korea, what, what Sabrino teaches us is Aea Korea died because he loved these people. And he would want us to focus on them. If you were to go to the chapel at the Uka today, you know what? you would see among many other things, including that amazing mural that I just had on the previous slide with the eight martyrs, that kind of powerful mural which is in the front of the church. If you walk into the church, come inside, and then turn around, it's a small chapel, it's no bigger than this room, and turn around and look at the back wall. You see a stations of the cross, but this time it's the stations of the cross not specifically of Jesus going to his death, but of the people of El Salvador. So I want you to inv invite you to just meditate on this with me for a moment, to take a look at these pictures. And I put them together with a poem by a wonderful American poet named Denise Levertov in a poem that she calls Thinking About El Salvador. And I chose the music from Peter Gabriel's soundtrack for The Last Temptation of Christ.
remembrance of martyrs draws us into the values, the hopes, the courage, the leadership that they lived for. And we focus on them not to focus on death, but on life. And we remember them not to remember the past, but curiously, almost in the logic of the Gospels, we remember the future. We remember the future for which they died, the values for which they lived. And so I end with the words of Aacrius friend John Sabrino in a letter written to him on the first anniversary of his friend's death. Sabrino said to Ignacio Aacria, over and above everything else, you were a person of mercy and compassion. The inmost depths of you, your guts and your heart, wrenched at the immense pain of this people. That's what never left you in peace. That's what put your special intelligence to work and channeled your creativity and your service. Your life was service the very special service of taking the crucified people down from the cross. Words very much your own, the kinds of words that take not only intelligence to invent, but intelligence moved by mercy. It's my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Bob LaSalle Klein, to speak more about A. Korea's friend, John Sabrino. Slideshow, I'm sure, is here somewhere. Where's my slideshow? <laughs> Wonderful. It's such a joy to be here today with you all and to share this time to remember. Some of us have spent half of our lives with this story. I look over there and see Dick Howard, who was present, was one of the first to be present at the bodies of the martyrs. Um, I was showing a video to my class the other night, and there's Dick uh, standing there with, with the first witnesses in this movie. And some of his former students were in the room and screamed out, uh, he's present. And some of you, this is your first time of hearing about this story. The very first time you're in a room, uh, maybe going a little deeper with this. And we're blessed to have a room like that because the flame of hope that was passed from Jesus through the martyrs to us is a story told that inspires a new generation. So we need always new generations of people who are moved by hope, who are willing to put their lives and then find their joys in accompanying those who are struggling for life. So I'm going to focus on John Sabrina today. John messed up my life a little bit. Uh, I was leading a community that was receiving Salvadoran and Guatemalan refugees into the Bay Area on the Underground Railroad in the late 80s. And I got to know John. And, um, and then, of course, the martyrs died. And uh, a few years later, I was ready to do my dissertation in Christology. So I went to John and I said, how about I write about your Christology? And he said, well, Bob, I'll work with you, but I want you to tell our story. I said, well, John, you know, I'm doing Christology, right? That's fundamental and history. And he says, well, if you want to go there, I'll, I'll be willing to work with you. So the door opened and I walked through it. And uh, this book that you see, Blood and Ink, that just came out, is, is a telling of their story. And the things I'm going to say to you today come, come from those pages. So John's story is that of fleeing from persecution born in Bilbao, Spain. You can see a picture up there on the top of uh, Aguirre leading a Basque party rally in 1933, right before the Spanish Civil War. The Basques chose the wrong side in the Civil War and ended up being bombed by German forces at the request of Franco. So his family had to free, flee in 1937, the very year of that bombing, to Barcelona, Spain, where he studied with the Jesuits. Um, from 48 to 50, later again at the 
upper school from 50 to 56, and entered the Jesuits in 1956. A year later, in 57, he and several classmates joined Miguel Elizondo at the new Jesuit novitiate in Santa Tecla in San Salvador. So you can see their pictures they get off the airplane there. That's a wonderful picture. That's Ignacio Ecria, the first time he set foot in El Salvador, getting off the plane with his novice master in front of him. One of the gifts that I have is they've opened the uh, computers of the Uca to me, giving me a lot of access. I have tons of these wonderful pictures. So I'm going to show you a few today. So following vows, John went to study humanities in Cuba, Havana, Cuba, from 1958 to 60. And there you can see where he studied, because <clears throat> the Jesuits had a strong presence in Cuba. Later, he went to St. Louis University, where he did undergraduate, a licentiate or master's in philosophy, and then an MA in engineering. And then they sent him back to San Salvador to teach. So he taught Latin and Greek at the diocesan seminary. You can see it there on the left in the middle and philosophy and math at the UCA, which was just a year old. Started in 64, 65. So he was part of this brand new university. They didn't even have a full campus. They were borrowing a campus from one of the other religious orders. And I love the story. The um, rector of the community said, well, your students are involved in drunken orgies every weekend. And so we can't really continue to host you. So you're going to have to find another home. So the UCA found another home. After that, he went to Germany, 66, and he worked with um, uh, Jürgen Moltmann, and he did his dissertation in 74, uh, a comparison of the Christologies of Jürgen Moltmann and Pannenberg, W. Pannenberg. Oh, yeah, that's a little of the background. But this talks about struggle and hope, right? Leadership born from struggle and hope. So what kind of struggles did John Sabrino face? Well, like many of us, he faced a demythologized theology. What does that mean? Well, you could see in the little pattern up there on the right, the ancients, first century, thought of the world like a dome. And at the top of the dome is the heavens. And there's water up there. And water drips through the dome, and that's rain. And it waters the earth. And of course, modern science, we know that that's not the case. So the uh, message of uh, Rudolf Bultmann and others was that we have to demythologize our faith. We have to find what what's lasts from that ancient faith and let go of this view of the world that's not sustainable anymore. So John describes that as a painful awakening from a dogmatic slumber. He says, God and faith were no longer evident to me. The faith of my childhood was, was, felt like it was slipping away. And he said he took solace in Ignacio Iacaria's statement, having studied with Rahner, that Karl Rahner carried his doubts with elegance. I suppose there's someone among us here who doesn't have doubts. But uh, he had many. And it helped him to know that Rahner had his doubts too. So he returned in 1974 to El Salvador, and he encountered another awakening taking place, an awakening that he describes as an awakening from the slumber of inhumanity with my Central American Jesuit companions. So many of us, right, we're, we're, we're asleep. I mean, I'm, I love the Giants, and I love following all the, you know, the ups and downs of the World Series. But I mean, really... There's a lot of bigger stories in the world than the Giants. So hopefully the Giants are a, a, a counterpoint. But there's a bigger story that belongs on the front page. The fact that 48% of humanity lives on less than $2 a day. I can't remember the last time that was on the front page. So John said we were waking up. And he said in waking up to the reality of the poor, God reappeared. The God that had been withdrawing. You know, the God of... of of his childhood faith and his young, and the faith as a young man had been withdrawing and he said he encountered this God he reappeared in a new way. Where? In the crucified people. Op fe, as it says in the appearances of the risen Jesus. I saw him. And he says even more surprising than that was that these people, the crucified people, 
appeared as good news, grace, salvation, without which I could not have done anything. And so I see, show those pictures at the bottom of Monsignor Romero, alive with joy, enjoying himself, becoming a, a more full person. And you see him sitting with, with uh, Campesino. Romero was never more alive than in the last three years of his life. So what did that produce? Well, it produced an encounter with God. The locus theologicus for Sabrina's mature thought is the crucified people and those who love them. Because those who love those the rest of society rejects are beautiful. That flame of hope burns bright in them. And we see it in their face and in their love. He likes, John quotes Rahner, saying, Catholic theology, despite its many dogmas and ethical norms, really says only one thing. The mystery remains forever mystery. Sabrino takes this and historicizes it and says, look, the problem is not finding God. In Europe, he thought the problem was finding God. But the problem is encountering him where he said he would be in Matthew 25. Hungry, alone, starving, needing a visit in prison. I didn't expect to find him there. Thus, he says, it's not that I now possess him, of course, or that the tragedy of this world no longer cries out for a response. But he says, I woke up so that today I would not be true to myself if I did not mention always with fear and trembling, God. The God who loves those who suffer. Loves all of us, but especially those among us who feel rejected. So that turned John into a new kind of person. A witness or a martyrios to love and hope. So he occupies a unique role, both as witness and interpreter of the unexpected grace that is the crucified people and those who love him. So he writes, I've been surrounded by an immense cloud of witnesses that have suffered the shedding of blood, as it says in the letters to the Hebrews. Magnificent people who have made the gospel speak like nothing else and who have made the depths of God and Jesus real with spontaneity and naturalness. And so when he heard of the death of his brothers in Thailand, because he was not there, he said to his audience, I must give you bad news. They have assassinated my entire community. But I must also tell you good news as well, because I have lived with good men, men of compassion, truth, and love. So the spirituality he leaves us, he says, um, or I would say, to state it clearly from the outset, the Uka Jesuits recognize the risen Jesus vibrant and alive in the crucified people of El Salvador. And through the years of service and solidarity as Christians, priests, university professors, they became bearers of Jesus' Holy Spirit to this crucified people and living signs of the resurrection. I've argued that he and Ignacio de Correa form together the most complete contextual theology written since Vatican II. And it's unified by two claims. One, the historical Jesus, which brings joy and salvation, is the real sign of the Word made flesh. The Word made flesh looked like that. And two, the Analogatum Princeps, or the principal analogy of God's self-offer in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is to be found where? In the crucified peoples of the planet. And so, he leaves us with a vision of the university. He tells us, a Korea, the martyrs, have made the most important advance on the idea of the university since Newman. And what is a Christian university? It's not the chapel. It's not how many times you go to Mass. All that's good. It's not how many colleges we have on campus. All that's good. It's how deep is its solidarity with the poor. 
That's what makes a university a Christian university. So I would just conclude by saying, um, John says that in El Salvador there was a grand tradition passed from hand to hand of dedication and love for the poor. It passed from Rutilio to Monsignor Romero to Ea Correa. And he says then another came. And his name was Dean Brackley. So my final words with Dean, spoken just before he went back to die in El Salvador. I said, Dean, it's amazing what God has done through you. The thousands of people who have been touched by the story of the martyrs, the people of El Salvador through you, the message of the gospel, and your wonderful presence. And Dean said, typically with a little smile on his face, God's good. But you know, Bob, a lot of it was just being in the right place at the right time. Circumstances, luck, all that. When the Jesuits died, I put up my hand and they called me. I said, well, Dean, God can call, but it doesn't go anywhere unless we say yes. And with a little smile on his face, Dean burned bright with the flame of the martyrs and the flame that needs to pass to us. And he said, digo si, senor. I'd like to introduce my colleague, Lynette Parker, who will talk about Santa Clara. So it's my honor um, to be able to share and to reflect on some of the work and the struggles and the service that the university, Santa Clara University, has um, been engaged in. Um, I want to start first with a quote. Um, Vamos todos al banquete, a la mesa de la creación. Cada cual con su tab taburete tiene un puesto y una misión. We are all going to the banquet, to the table of creation. Each one on his stool has a place and a mission. And those were words of Father Rodilio Grande. A life of service, one of the things that is very special about Santa Clara University is the, the call, the, the commitment of the university um, to service. And it brings a lot of students and faculty here who have dedicated their life to service, to different projects. One example of many, many, many of those is the La Asa students, the law students, who in hearing about the troubles and the, the trials of day workers in East San Jose and the fact that they were working long hours and were not getting paid, decided to put their, their education to use to work on behalf of those workers to claim wages for which they were not being paid. Their faculty have dedicated their lives to things that are projects, um, to, to projects like Habitat for Humanity, to food kitchens, to working on behalf of displaced indigenous in Chiapas, Mexico. A life dedicated in response to needs draws us together. Um, and they oftentimes were called to respond to the needs. Um, after, in the aftermath of the, in the civil conflict in El Salvador as witnesses, witnesses to rebuilding, witnesses to project strengthening poor communities. It's Santa Clara University students who created walls and murals to address the plights of immigrants and the difficulties that immigrants have in our communities. The Community Law Center has been working on behalf of victims of human trafficking over the past 11 years and is now responding to the, the surge of unaccompanied minors who are arriving in our communities from the borders. We have a tradition at Santa Clara of dedicating our lives to homeless, to elderly, to youth, to mental health challenges and trauma. Our graduates go out into the community and they're working in service projects um, are the, the light, are the part of the struggle that they have begun here at Santa Clara University. We also have the tradition of responding in times of need. I don't see how you can show love without being in solidarity with the victims of the world. We have, as you know, responded to times of need because need does not occur in a vacuum. 
there's issues that arise that are connected. And the civil conflicts in El Salvador and Guatemala, many persons fled as refugees to the United States. They ended up poor and in neighborhoods, urban neighborhoods that were also very poor. And their children faced challenges, education, violence on the streets. And many in response to the violence created a way to protect themselves. Those children were re returned, deported back to El Salvador and Guatemala, did not have the support systems in place to, re to receive them, did not remember the countries because they had fled as children and ended up in gangs. And we are now seeing over the past years children, youth, who are fleeing El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras because of gang violence. And they're arriving at our borders. And the law center has been, over the past few years, assisting those young people to find safe haven in the United States. Listening and paying attention to the, what the community needs is so important. Using our talents and our skills to address those needs, but to address the needs as a community and as individuals say what their needs are. It's important to not assume a victim of human trafficking wants to be identified as such, that they might want to return home and not stay here. It's important to listen to communities' pressing needs. What is the pressing need? Housing, employment, drinking water, trauma services. What is an individual most need? A phone card to call home to let the family know that they are safe. One of the sad stories that I've heard recently is that a lot of parents who are sending their children north because they want a better life for their kids, they want their kids to be able to live, don't hear for their kids for a long time and don't know if the kids are alive or dead. And being able for those kids to find a way to call home to let their parents know they're safe is so, so important. Our response, stepping forward, is part of what we do here through immersions, through work on projects. The response is finding ways to serve when and where the needs arise. Peace is not the product of terror or fear. Peace is not the silence of cemeteries. It is not the silence, silent result of violent repression. Peace is a generous, tranquil contribution of all to the good of all. Peace is dynamism, peace is generosity, it is right and it is duty. Our efforts are amplified and multiplied here on campus through community, through immersions, through involvement in networks. For example, one example that we have is connections to the South Bay Coalition to End Human Trafficking. We build bridges and find ways to further our work through local communities, webs of grassroots organizations. We connect our projects to communities through our enthusiasm, skills, and energies for work. We are sustained by community. Common goals of com competence, compassion, conscience. It's a recognition and encouragement of our, each other to keep us going in terms of our work here at the university. With the community of Jesuits, walking with members of the com Santa Clara community, supporting and encouraging services, Faculties and students reach outside of their comfort and outside of what they know in terms of the studies that they are doing, in terms of the disciplines that they work in, reaching across disciplines to work together on projects. One example, the Law Center works with human trafficking victims. The engineering department is now working with, also with the coalition, to develop technology, cell phone technology for victims of human trafficking. And as we reach across and we create joint projects, we are able to have a bigger impact. We are able to serve a broader base. We find strength in our ties to each other, to partners on the ground locally and internationally. The importance of the university is passing the torch. There are two aspects to every university. The first and most evident is that it deals with culture and knowledge and the use of intellect. The second, and not so evident, is that it must be concerned with the social reality. Precisely because a university is inescapably a social force, it must transform and enlighten the society in which it lives. We make change over time. 
building institutions, programs, courses. Santa Clara University pay, promotes change over the long-term struggles and investments of time and resource. Peace does not happen overnight. It requires patience and hard work. Ending exploitation of workers and immigrants will take time because of the forces of fear and greed. But the institutions and programs and courses that we create will be able to make those long-term changes. Our responsibility to educate the next generations will, who will serve and lead. We reach out to the community. We create a pebble that creates ripples. And the students, each one of you as students, will create your ripples. And all of those ripples together make the changes. Education and training, passing the torch is educating students, is creating dialogue, is talking about and thinking about and questioning and engaging. But it's also the opportunity to practice, to put into practice the education that you have through training, through projects, through things like the projects that are done in the community for, with youth, with um, immigrant communities. For example, and this is where I am most familiar, the law students who work with workers who've been paid less than a dollar an hour for the work that they do, helping them get back wages, helping them get compensation for the work that they've done. Um, training that also helps persons seek and get safety, youth who are fleeing gang violence. We as an intellectual community must analyze causes, use imagination, creativity together to discover the remedies to our problems. Commute, communicate to our constituencies a conscience that inspires the freedom of self-determination. Educate professionals with a conscience who will be the immediate instruments of such transformation. And constantly hone an educational institution that is both academically excellent and ethically oriented. All of us. The struggle and hope in the life and leadership of Santa Clara is evidenced by all of us and the work that we engage in individually, collectively. It is our choices and our participation. We can choose to acknowledge the needs of the communities in our midst and answer the call to address those needs. How have we dedicated our vocational skills and resources? How have we chosen to participate? How has our vocational leadership emerged from struggle and hope? These are questions for each and every one of us. Our commitment and compassion are a beacon of light in dark times. Our source of inspiration to others. Our testament to our faith in the human spirit and humanity's resilience. And our commitment and compassion are born of struggle and hope we hope to bring justice and healing to our communities in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much to all four speakers. We, I'd like now to invite them to come up and just to take some questions and answers. So please come up. That was a fairly um, significant set of, even though there are brief presentations, and and we're always quite aware that sometimes it can be can take a while to receive these, and and to assimilate it. So let's acknowledge that. Um, let's give ourselves maybe a, a thirty seconds to to just allow what it was that we heard to deepen in us, and out of that maybe a question or two or reflection might bubble up.
And so we'll open the floor to any questions that people would have for an individual speaker or comments or thoughts. And we have, we have a roving microphone, so you can just raise your hand and, and one of our roving students will give you a microphone. Hi, my name is Anupam Goyal. Um, what, uh, two things came stood out to me among others. Uh, one was that he was trying to mediate a war and not take sides. And the other thing is he died for the same logic. So we see this story, the names and the locations and the people change. But a uh, similar thing appealed to me for Gandhi, where the last mm. viceroy of India said, I have 50,000 soldiers on Western Front unable to stop violence, and one soul fasting on the Eastern Front, which has stopped all violence. Mm. So they were people who were not taking sides. They were people who were trying to end a war without taking side and mediators. And they were killed, like Gandhi by a Hindu or Yitzhak Rabin by a Jew, in, in trying to prevent war, in trying to mediate peace. But one comment that was made was, it, they are a witness. And the witness changes those who are influenced by them. In fact, there was a cartoon where Gandhi and Martin Luther King are laughing in heaven, and they are saying, and the assassins thought they could kill us. <laughs> okay. Would any of you like to just comment on that? Yeah, I had a thought. Um, you know, Gandhi's ahimsa, right, is, is truth force. And um, he believed that the power of truth was greater than any force on earth. And um, the reason why the Jesuits were killed because because they were telling the truth, but they believed that that truth would bring life despite their deaths, and in fact, it helped contribute to bringing an end to the war since it destroyed support in Congress uh, for for the war, and it inspired another generation. So I think they share that belief in the power of truth and words. Uh, as being more powerful than guns and violence. And I would just add to Bob's point, there, there really is a partiality in the Jesuits in El Salvador. We see it like we see it in the witness of Martin Luther King or Gandhi or others. Their partiality is not a side-taking in the way that the sides have been drawn up by those with, in the case of El Salvador, it was an incredibly violent, repressive uh, social situation, as Ana Maria pointed out, and then you had a revolution, com uh, you know, contrasting with that, and everybody wanted to say, well, the Jesuits are on this side or that side, or you know, Romero was on this side and then switched to that side, and what they're trying to say is, we're on the side of those who have no side. In fact, if I may just interject with a brief moment, it's going to have to be brief because we want to. Uh, in fact, when I received PhD, the doctor, uh, Peter Likens, president of the university, said, you should use your life to give voice to those who have none. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Other questions? Thank you. I don't know who to ask this to, but I'm sure that one of you might have some ideas. 25 years later, what are some of the issues that the UCA has has faced and, and how they tried to face those issues in living out the vision that that, have, that you have uh, sketched of what a university ought to be. Do you want to jump in? I mean, one of the main things I'm aware of is that uh, in the last several years, more people have died of violent crime in El Salvador than during the worst years of the war. That the country's been a lot, uh, left awash in guns, in gangs, and in um, in w with incredible unhealed, uh, you know, just wounds left by that period. It wasn't just a war, as you know. It was a. It was just an incredibly dehumanizing uh, violation of human dignity and the rest. And so. Part of the thing that's really interesting is that the United States medals, 
you know, this is part of where we, our conscience comes into play. And, and then the a country disappears from the front pages of the, of the newspaper. I mean, it was the country that was mentioned the most under Reagan. It disappears under Clinton. But that doesn't mean we weren't still involved in all sorts of ways in terms of the economy. And you'll hear the official story, and then you hear what's actually going on. So one of the things the UCA continues to try to do, by the way, one of the great crimes of the Jesuits that they were killed for was they wanted to tell the truth. And the way they did it was by founding, for example, a polling agency or a social science research agency. And so they try to draw out what in fact is going on and that continues. And, and the UCA San Salvador is exemplary in its ability to just, to do what universities are meant to do, which is to try to get the data the real data in front of people, and then also to be a place of conscience and memory. I like to think of a university as not only a place with great libraries and great research centers, but also great capacity to remember. If I could add something to that also, I think they're dealing with current issues and concerns. Um, a lot of the water, um, the rivers are polluted, there's not drinkable water, and um, because of mining that happened in the country, there is issues in terms of um, the air that people are breathing. There is many, many things that are happening with you know, poverty, and so I think the university is stepping up to the plate and dealing not only with things that come from out of the past conflicts, but also some of the realities, concerns that are day-to-day are -day in terms of, you know, food, in terms of the environment, in terms of um, issues including, and this is something that impressed me, um, dealing with the new legislation on human trafficking. So the, the issues that we deal with and the issues that are being dealt with with many countries around the world are facing in different ways, but facing El Salvador and the university has stepped up to the plate on those as well. So maybe, just a short, oh you go. Yeah, maybe just to say that one of the um, elements that we don't think about very often is what it did to families. Mm -hmm. uh, families were divided, were in conflict with each other, destroyed each other, and the wounds from, from that dynamic has yet to be healed. Um, it's a reality. And today, in, in some ways, El Salvador feels uh, very unsafe. Um, I, I would just say migration, immigration, the church, and the Jesuits. Um, my, migration, uh, this summer I was with the Ignatian Solidarity Network. We had 45 people from all over the United States. Uh, we were at the UCA, many workshops on migration. They're very aware that Salvadoran kids are running away from violence. Um, mining is destroying the ecological environment and it's supported, it's many U.S. companies that are driving that. With the Jesuits, um, um, Rudolfo Cardinal said um, after the assassinations, we kind of went into a depression. And it was very hierarchical. It was really Jesuit dominated because during the war, um, the lay people left. Uh, so they had to rework it. Uh, how do we run a university with Jesuit leadership without Jesuit domination? And how do we Central Americanize us? Where, you know, these guys are all Spaniards. So they, they've, had, they've got their struggles, but I, I, I think the UCA is in kind of a rebirth. I mean, I, I see new energy there. I'd like to privilege student questions. So you, students usually sit at the back. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna try to get you to ask uh, a, a question. Do any, do any students have have questions? If not, I'll channel you. <laughs> because actually, one of the things that, that I think is really interesting uh, about each of your presentations is this idea of leadership born of struggle, struggle and hope. Um, when I talk to students these days, they're all um, really quite concerned with the stress of, of where we are in the quarter, mm -hmm. uh, in exams, etc. And, and frequently we look at stress as something that is uh, sometimes, you know, this, is, this doesn't have a productive nature. Sometimes stress doesn't have, isn't productive. But I think in each of your, in, in, in the, the people that you talked about, stress or struggle 
actually had was the impetus to important creativity and leadership. I didn't know about Rutilio Grande and his personal struggles. So do you have any thoughts on that? Or, or um, particularly for, for students who feel stress, how, um, how they might see it as, as a, a, uh, something that, that can bring them to the next level of creativity? Yeah, it's a really neat question, and one of the things that strikes me just intuitively, uh, not necessarily directly with reference to the story that we were just talking about, except to say it this way, I think what makes stress really unbearable is when it combines with being alone. When you can't, when you have no place to go with it. When, when, and, and I think that there's a, almost a diabolical combination between stress and loneliness. And so I think one of the most creative things that, and, and we don't oftentimes acknowledge how important it is that happens in our time, for example, in college, is making really good friendships and having people with whom, not just to be able to party and laugh and that sort of thing, but actually be able to talk about what's going on. To be able to finally come out from behind whatever masks we normally live with, and we all have them, and they're productive to a certain extent, but to be able to say, this is who I really am, and this is really hard. And I think the key to making stress productive is community. That's interesting because I was going to say something similar. Uh, live for love, not just for the resume. Um, you'll do so much more for for love when you when you have a goal that matters and, and you care. Some of you have immigrant parents. And you're trying to get to the next generation and and be the college. I mean, that matters. You know, you're doing it for your family. Others want to go serve and change the world. And there are those who just want a high-paying job. And that'll carry you for a while, but not so far. So I think that's their story, is it, it, it will really carry you. Love will really carry you a long way. And it's very creative and resourceful. When I was sharing about Frutilio Grande, it seemed um, perhaps very dark and heavy, and um, he suffered, he did suffer from Great Depression. But he also had this uh, vibrancy about him and his joy, and loved being with the people. And that was one of the things he did with the seminariums. He would take him out of the seminary to the little villages where they were celebrating a patronal feast or a holiday. And then he would, um, from that joy, just be enlivened. And I think that also happened with uh, the students that he mentored and many other people whose lives he touched. So it was this joy, this joy of life and wherever it's uh, meant to be a gift for us. And I think I would add to that, I, I found that students who connect what you're learning in classrooms, connect your education to something, some, to something practical, some way that you can take what you're learning and put it to use for someone in the community or some group in the community, that you can take and connect it to something outside of the university. It gives you um, a sort of a sense of why it is that you're in the classroom to begin with, what it is that you're doing with your education, where is it that you're going with it. And it kind of, it grounds it in a way that gives you energy to keep, sometimes when classes are really hard or when you're facing final exams, um, it's nice to have sort of a connective, oh, so this is what is going to help me be able to do at some point in time to do now with what I'm learning. Hi. I had a quick question. Um, one of the speakers, I couldn't really see because I was sitting, but um, mentioned that a Christian university is one that is in solidarity with the poor. So I was wondering how you guys reconcile Santa Clara being a Christian university and also uh, charging one of the most expensive tuition rates in the country. <laughs> well, I think several of us said it, but I, I certainly was one. And um, here's the thing to, to know about the UCA. Um, it's not heaven on earth. Uh, the UCA is the Harvard of El Salvador. So the richest kids are going there. Um, and there's tons of people who do not plug in at all to the whole solidarity mission. So it's very important not to 
not to idealize it. Um, it's a struggle within that community to to try to live this out. Um, <clears throat> I'm a Santa Clara grad. My daughter is a junior here. Uh, Several years back, I picked up John Sabrino, and we were driving in the car. And this may be ten years ago, maybe more. And uh, and I was complaining, like you did, about Santa Clara. Uh, you know, Santa Clara, come on, kind of a bubble, isn't it? And John, no, no bulb. Bob de Salle, no. That's what he says. He says, Santa Clara has stood by us, and they are doing real things, and we appreciate what Santa Clara has done. And so I think what matters is you're doing something, and some of those things are real. They're not just pretend, and they make a difference in people's lives, and that counts. It's not perfect. It could be a lot better. And, and I heard Lynette's challenge to her colleagues to get more involved. But it's something's happening and it's real. And you know, you're right. It is a really expensive university. Uh, ex universities have become unbelievably expensive. And it's, it's scary. And economists don't know where this, whether we're going to have another bubble, like with housing a few years back, with universities becoming so expensive. Santa Clara works really hard to try. I, I know this because I was an administrator here for a while. It works hard to try and find the balance point between a very expensive tuition and then providing assistance where they can for students. And actually, quite a few students get at least some assistance. None of that answers your question. The, the, the contradiction you're putting your finger on remains. And I think Bob's point actually goes to the heart of it. It's not a question of should we all just give away everything we have. That is a real call. And one needs to do that with really carefully discerned. One really needs to know what spirit they're following if they're going to do that. But it is, can we take what we've been given? Can you take this very, very expensive and very fine education and put it to service as something that's bigger, that builds a future to the world? So let me tell you one thing that Santa Clara is doing that hardly anybody knows about. There's, there's a lot of religious women in Asia who have absolutely no access to education places like China, in Vietnam, in India. There are more than 100,000 Catholic sisters in India. And fewer than 50 have doctorates in theology. And Santa Clara is making ways available for those sisters to come here to study so they can go back home and transform the lives of people back home. Their education is extremely expensive if you just measure it in dollars and cents. But it's an education that can have an enormous impact on a world, lifting up a world. And that's something, there's a lot of little stories about that, about our university. It ain't perfect. And there's, there are things to legitimately complain about. But it's complex and there's a lot of things happening through that complexity that are really trying to touch our world. Let's take that as a moment to thank our four speakers uh, for, for everything that you have shared with us this afternoon. It's very for, helpful for us to have evaluations of, of these events, so either at your table or electronically, that would be very helpful. There are books available. Uh, um, Balasal Klein has talked about a, a, a book. Um, uh, so there are books available, and, they, and, and I know that our, our speakers would be happy to sign them. And just so you know, this is the first in a series of Santa Clara events commemorating the 25th anniversary. Next weekend, our final Bennett Institute lecture of the fall quarter will, be, uh, will feature Lucia Serna and Mary Jo Igno, uh, Ignofo, uh, the authors of La Verdad, a witness to the Salvadoran martyrs, uh, in conversation with Father Luis Calero. The following day, November 13th at 4 o'clock, there will be a prayer service at the Mission Church, remembering those who have died in the struggle for justice. Uh, on Sunday, November 16th, there will be a particular focus on the martyrs of this, all of the Sunday liturgies uh, at 10 a.m., 6 p.m., and 9 p.m. 
And along with everything else that happens here on campus, there will be a number of events occurring in El Salvador to commemorate the lives and the witness of the Jesuit martyrs. We're excited to have representatives of the Santa Clara delegation attending these events with us here tonight, and we wish them all the well on their journey. One final thing, in these cabinets uh, to the right of us, there are materials from the archives, Santa Clara archives, related to the relationship between UCA and Santa Clara. Once more, thank you very much for your wonderful attention, and let's let's join us in one final thank you for our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.